Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us at the Corporate Connect this evening. This webinar is organized by SIAS and supported by SGX. We will kick off tonight's webinar with a pre recorded presentation by Mr. Jeff Howey from SGX on recent market highlights, followed by a corporate presentation and end off with a Q&A session. This evening, uh, we are pleased to have the senior management from Halcyon Agri and Halcyon Rubber Company. All right, may I have the video, please? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeff Howie from Singapore Exchange, and I'll uh, have the next 10 minutes or so just to run through a few recent market highlights. Before we do, just a kind reminder that this is designed to be an informative uh, presentation and is all educational, not providing any investment advice. Okay, so straight into it, the road to recovery of the global economy uh, and I guess the resilient global capital markets in 2021 did have a profound impact on both the Singapore economy and of course the stock market. The SDI generated a 14% total return in 2021 that outpaced the broader APAC gains of around 2%. This brought the five-year annualised total return of the SDI to 5.4%, pretty similar to the FTSE ASEAN All Share Index, which was 3.7%. And of all these uh, regional parent indices, if you will, we are most correlated to the FTSE ASEAN All Share Index. I think a simple correlation of around 95% over the five-year period. Uh, less correlated, obviously, to the FTSE uh, China Index and the Hang Seng Index. And as you can see, um, really, over those five years, global banks had a big impact on the STI, which is why the STI has gained a little bit more than the region and where a lot of the outperformance was over that five-year period was in global technology stocks uh, and the most traded technology stocks in Singapore I've just included their five-year average annualized total returns here in the chart as well because sometimes uh, to look for investment returns and and more risk if you wish to take more risk in the market uh, it's good to look a little bit beyond the actual benchmark okay but nonetheless a key driver of the uh, the total return of the STI last year at 14% was, of course, the actual sector composition of the index. So last year, we saw global semiconductor stocks among the strongest industries rallying something like 40% over the year, and global bank stocks also rallied over 20%. Global hospitality stocks ended the year in the red, and globally, airlines pretty much remained flat for the year. Now, the gradual reopening of borders, it really matters for most sectors, from airlines to banks and so forth. Advanced uh, fourth quarter estimates for our GDP that were released on the 3rd of Jan, they indicate that the Singapore economy actually rebounded 7% last year, led by the goods producing, manufacturing industries and construction industries, while the service oriented industries expanded something like 5.2%. Now in 2022, Singapore's economic growth rate is expected to moderate, but remain above trend at three to 5% throughout the year. The growth will be dependent obviously on the momentum of manufacturing industries, in addition to the continued recovery of service oriented industries and the construction industry. Now, while the construction sector rebounded 19% last year, based on these advanced estimates, the uh, MTI has really noted that in absolute terms, the value added of the sector remained 26% below, 26 below its pre-COVID 4Q19 level, as activity at construction work strikes continue to be weighed down by labour shortages due to the border restrictions on migrant workers. Back in 2020, Singapore's construction sector declined 36%, while the manufacturing sector that year expanded 7%, and the services producing industries back in 2020 declined 7%. It means that Singapore's 7% economic rebound in 2021, it did follow a 5% contraction in 2020. And likewise, the SDI's 14% total return last year did follow a decline of 5% in 2020. Now, after surpassing the 2021 high on Friday, 
the Monday session saw the STI also surpass its 2020 high, which had pre previously been 3283.89. So that would represent a 20 month high, 29 month high since the 33.11 high back on the 1st of August 2019. And it also places the STI in the first 10 sessions of the year up 5% since the 31st of December and within 4% of the April 2019 high of 34.15 and within 10% of the May 2018 high and close to 50% above that March 2020 low of 22.08. So bank stocks have been a key driver of the gains placing the STI alongside the S&P CNX Nifty 50 as Asia Pacific's strongest stock market in the first 10 sessions of the year. Now, bank stocks, as we said, have led the STI, but they really have led the global stock market as well in early January. Across the world, we've seen bank stocks rally around 10%, led by the US. The past 10 sessions have been also seen, uh, well, there's 10 sessions also show the that ended in January 14, also saw DBS, OCBC, and UOB average 10% gains on close to 580 million SING dollars of net institutional inflow. Now the rally in the banks has really been on the back of a 20 basis point upward structural shift in the two to 10 US yield curve in early January, which has added to the 60 basis point upward structural shift we saw in that yield curve in 2021. So while the slope of the 210 yield curve has returned to around 80 basis points, as it was 54 weeks ago at the end of 2020, the curve has structurally shifted up 80 basis points since the end of 2020 on a more hawkish outlook for US interest rates, more recently on the recent inflation prints than the growth in um, then the, the I should say the growth in employment gains. Now the normalization of interest rates is a key driver for the banks with US interest rate increases seen to positively impact net interest margins of DBS, OCBC and UOB. Now from the fourth quarter of 2019 right through to the third quarter of 2021, DBS's NIM net interest margin uh, it declined by around 40 basis points to 1.86% to 1.43%. OCBC's net interest margins declined 25 basis points from the fourth quarter of 2019 to 1.52% in the third quarter of 2021. And likewise, UOB's NIM declined around 20 basis points from 1.76% to 1.55%. Now net interest margins impact net interest income but as does loan growth. And for their nine months of this year, the first nine months of, I should say, FY21, the most recent year, um, NII made up 57, net interest income made up 57% of DBS's total income, 54% of OCBC's total income, and 64% of UOB's total income. That was for the first nine months of FY21. Now in, um, 2021, UOB also reiterated in its corporate presentations that Southeast Asia maintained immense growth prospects with UOB seeing revenue potential from connecting the dots in the region. Um, for its first nine months of last year, 51% of its operating profit was segmented to Singapore, while as much as 25% was segmented to Singapore's ASEAN neighbours. And on Friday, UOB continued to connect the dots and further strengthen uh, its, its, its ASEAN business by proposing it would acquire Citigroup's consumer business in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. UOB are uh, proposing to pay a cash consideration of $915 million plus the NAV of Citi's consumer business. Uh, which has a customer base of around 2.4 million as of 30th June. So that con city's consumer business NAB was, it had a, it was around 4 billion SING dollars. Now, while the institutional inflows of the banks was an early standout in January, as we said, around $580 million of net inflow, it did follow 1.8 billion of combined net institutional inflows in 2021 but retail have continued to be net sellers after net retail flows did show an element of measured profit taking in 2021. For instance, 
for DBS, the 2021 VWAP volume weighted average price for that year was $29.27. That was 36 36% above the 2020 VWAP with net retail outflows in 2021 at around 12% of the net retail inflows of 2020. For OCBC, its VWAP was up 25% last year from the previous year and its net retail outflows in 2021 were around 10% of the net retail inflows of 2020. And then for UOB, the VWAP last year was around 21% higher than the 2020 VWAP, while net retail outflows in 2021 were at 9% of the net retail inflows of 2020. Now on the inflation front, the US uh, December CPI that was released last week, it did come in within expectations. And on a year on year basis, the, ga the gauge did um, margin marginally accelerate to 7% year on year from 6.8% year on year in November. The next US CPI uh, update will be on the 10th of February. Um, and also we did see on Wednesday last week, China's December PPI did decelerate, albeit more marginally uh, from 12.9% year on year in November to 10.3% year on year in, in December. Most economists do forecast the current wave of global inflation to peak in mid-year as both mainstream and heterodox economists do see inflation as monetary policy driven phenomena. And this means that the inflation cycle really began in 2020 with the extraordinary monetary policy support that has worked its way through the key gauges at present. And it has really been structurally sustained, if not, um, if you will, by uh, pent up demand in the US and Europe, uh, and of course the higher commodity prices and food prices. And Fed Chair Jerome Powell has maintained pretty much since June last year, oil prices and supply chain bottlenecks remain the key variables to watch. So more than, um, on this last slide, more than 90% of the day-to-day -day, uh, turnover of Singapore stocks in 2021 has been generated by the most traded 150 stocks. So we've, 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 we've covered the banks just now, which account for about 20% of our day-to-day -day turnover of the stock market. And then if you extend the lens to the uh, 150 most traded, these stocks all account, as we said, for nine tenths of our day-to-day -day turnover. Now with both macroeconomic and microeconomic factors at play last year, as many as 18 of the 150 stocks saw their trading turnover in 2021 grow more than tenfold from 2020 levels. Another 15% of the 150 stocks saw their trading turnover grow more than fivefold. So it means that more than 20% of the most traded stocks in 2021 basically saw significant turnover growth. Okay, the 18 stocks with the tenfold increase averaged um, uh, 166 price rate gains. I think that 138% was the median return for those 18 stocks over the year, but at the same time did average triple digit percentage price volatility. And of those 18 stocks, OIO Holdings saw the highest increase in turnover, RH Petrogas saw the highest return, and Del Monte Pacific maintained the highest market cap. The, the 18 stocks also included Grand Venture Technologies, which completed its transfer from the Catalyst to the main board on 30th of November. And on 5th of January, the company also announced its third facility acquisition in Malaysia, which I think is in the space of two years. And is, it's um, obviously doing this as it gears up to meet its anticipated growth demand from the semiconductor industry. Now, the next 15 stocks after those 18 with the five-fold increase in daily turnover, they average 47% price gains with a median return of 48%, but at the same time, as we said, averaging more risk uh, with 56% price volatility. Of those 15 stocks, leader environments saw the highest increase in turnover, the hourglass saw the highest return, and Thompson Medical currently maintains, of those 15, the highest market cap. We should just mention uh, Del Monte as it does maintain, as we said, the highest market cap uh, of the 18 stocks that saw a more than tenfold increase in trading turnover. After it reported its net profits soared to 63 million US dollars in its FY21, which ended well back in 30th of April last year, it basically, um, it, it reported a first half 
of FY22 ending 31st of October, net profit tripled year on year to I think 54 million US dollars. And that was supported by high US and international market sales, including its S&W business in Asia. So as I said, while these stocks tabled um, did see significant increases in their day-to-day -day turnover, they also did uh, have uh, comparatively higher volatility over the year. Um, as we said, for the stocks that uh, saw a five-fold increase in turnover, they averaged more than 50% volatility. For the stocks that inc saw uh, turnover increase by more than tenfold, they saw uh, on average uh, around 100% volatility. Now, by comparison, when you look at DBS, OCBC and UOB, they averaged around 20% um, price gains last year, as we said. I think it was 21% price gains to be exact, uh, but that was on the back of 16% volatility, so significantly less volatility. But nonetheless, um, I will wrap up here and just to mention that, I guess, as we say, many of the macroeconomic drivers of last year, including resilient investment, uh, the new global trade records, higher commodity prices, semiconductor demand, they uh, are continuing to drive stocks coming into this year. Obviously, a very close look is being made on COVID-19 with Omicron more transmissible but less severe than, uh, than the Delta variant. That has been a support to stocks globally. And as we said, it has been very much led by bank stocks so far in the year. And I think um, the look towards continued uh, gradual reopening of borders has also seen the airline stocks uh, globally pick up a little bit over the last over the last two weeks or so but much much remains to see be seen uh, going into the year how uh, how the world continues to uh, to adapt and how, by how much the COVID-19 will constrain growth and particularly uh, impact some containment measures particularly in uh, Asia's greatest the biggest economy China thank you thank you May I now invite Mr. Lee Xue Tao, uh, Group CEO of uh, uh, Halcyon Agri, to give his welcome address. Mr. Lee, please. Yes, thank you, Eli. Uh, much appreciated for the arrangement uh, from SIES. So, uh, yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so, I'm uh, David Lee Xue Tao, I'm the CEO of Halcyon Agri. So, uh, First of all, uh, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your time to join this uh, webinar and on the presentation of Health and Agri. So uh, during uh, 2021, uh, our management of Health and Agri have successfully led the team to navigate uh, those uh, headwinds uh, caused by COVID-19. And we have taken uh, many uh, uh, effective actions and uh, we have the vision uh, to be the uh, one of the best uh, natural play in uh, deliver sustainable development in the natural industry and we uh, are working towards the uh, four pillars to uh, uh, for the excellence means customer excellence uh, financial excellence uh, operational excellence and corporate excellence. So I'm very pleased to uh, uh, share with you that uh, we have uh, successfully uh, uh, made a turnaround of Hershen in 2021. Means uh, our uh, forecasted uh, full year 2021 results will uh, turn from uh, loss of 2020 to a decent profit in 2021. We have just released our uh, announcement on the profit guidance at seven o'clock tonight. So hopefully uh, you will uh, read it. So I will invite uh, uh, our MD of HRC, which is the processing platform for Hashin, to uh, present you with uh, our understanding on our business operation and on the, natural, uh, on the natural price and the forecast of the natural market. And then followed by the present presentation of uh, Mr. Ng, uh, our CFO Jeremy will uh, present uh, you with our uh, uh, financial performance. So uh, 
hope uh, I hope you will enjoy the present the presentation from Mr. Ong. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I uh, invite Mr. Ong to present the corporate presentation? Mr. Ong, please. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm not sure any one of you are from different time zone, so I guess that if there is any, is a good morning to all your to all of you. So uh, today, I think uh, I will just do a very brief uh, introduction about the rubber industry, and then uh, and then about background about Halcyon, and then of course the most important thing is why I believe that this is a, a stock that you guys should think about. Okay, so maybe we go to the, the agenda. Uh, so we'll go through with the first section, which is the overview of the natural rubber industry. A lot of people has been asking, so what is natural rubber industry a sunset industry? And, and I have to say that a lot of people, I, some, some of them do not know and are not familiar with that. So today, the first section, we'll just give you a high level flavor. What is a natural rubber about? What is the application of the rubber? And how is it being used? So the next slide, please. So if you look at the globally, this is not a sunset industry. This is a very popular industry. And every year, 14.1 million tons of rubber has been transacted. It's produced and it's being uh, uh, bought. And where are the application? 71% of the rubber is being used in tires, in terms of the passenger car, truck buses, airplane tires. And of course, the remaining 29% is on a non-tire application where this includes the deep products like uh, the glove and the condoms and also the industrial products. Those parts that we don't even realize that exist. So this is where the rubber, I mean, this is not a sunset industry. This is a rubber industry where it's highly demanded by all of us. Okay, next. And another thing that people don't realize as well is the supply of the rubber. The supply of rubber doesn't just uh, click a finger, you'll get it. This require a dedicated investment from year one. It will take seven years to go to a state where we can actually harvest it. And for that, they will take another until the year 30 before that we actually will cut down the trees and take it as a rubber wood and we go through the replanting stage again. So this is where I want to emphasize this. This is where Halcyon has also has one of the biggest plantation uh, in Africa. And that a lot of uh, investors sometimes do not factor it in, in terms of their valuations and how to understand our shares. And, and, and the following few slides will be giving you some perspective, right? How do we see it? And, and hope you guys will look into it. Okay, so next. So in terms of the rubber uh, product, the usage, just a little bit of uh, industry information. So on average for the passenger and light truck tires, the whole tires there, if let's say 20% uh, of that is consists of natural rubber. And of course with synthetics and steels and all the others. For truck tires is about 30 over percent. So you look at here, a lot of people will then say, oh, synthetic rubber will be replacing natural rubber. That's completely not true. Why? Because natural rubber uh, is possess a lot of properties that synthetic rubber cannot provide. For example, the tensile strength, the high resistance to the wear and cut, right? And also, the, it's a, also it can absorb vibration. And the most important things is compared to the synthetic rubber, is a bio-based and is sustainable. If you look at the footnote at the bottom, okay, I just work out the translation just now about, there are 1.6 billion vehicles in use. What does it mean translate to the, the metric tons of rubber is being used? It's equivalent to about 11.2 million tons rubber. So once that you have cars in the world, you will need natural rubber. This is the message I would like to uh, deliver uh, to the, to all of you. Okay, next. So uh, on the rubber supply chain, of course, we start with the trees, then the small holders and the farmers will go and tap the rubber and then you will send it to the factories, which we have a, a substantial presence before we will convert it into a finished goods from our, uh, from our terms. 
It will be a raw material for the tire makers and other of our customers, which will then convert to an end product. And then it will again be distributed and sold to a consumers like all of us. So in this value chain, Halcyon Agri was involved in all of these three key value chains. We have presence in plantation, we have present in processing, and we are present in distribution. And the next slide will show you where is our presence. Next. So if you look at the map, we are actually a global company. We have 38 production facilities globally with the uh, installed capacity of 1.6 million ton. At the moment, I would say that we are running at about 65% capacity utilization. That means that there's room for more expansion for, for increased utilization. We have 69,000 hectare in Africa and Malaysia plantation, which is all planted. Uh, we also have office and facilities in 100 plus location globally. So just to give you some perspective, where is our presence? So if you look at the map, we are present in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, China. We have also in Vietnam. And we also have in uh, Europe, in Germany, and in Amsterdam. We also have in US. In Africa, we have Cameroon, our plantation areas, and also Ivory Coast, one of the most promising areas of uh, upcoming rising star of natural rubber production. Next. So the, the, the division that I'm heading uh, is a Halcyon Rubber Company, which is predominantly covering the processing factories uh, across uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, China, Thailand, and Ivory Coast. We have a three sales uh, outlet, let's call it. First in Singapore, our headquarters. We have Shanghai that cover our China market and Qingdao is our free trade. Uh, bonded areas. So this, this business is about capturing the margins from raw materials all the way to the uh, finished goods to the tire makers. So we, our key selling point is our products are all on a Hevia Pro brand. We focus on four key attributes. The first one is a quality. Uh, second one is a environment, health and safety. So we ensure that we are always put EHS on our top priority. Supply chain security. So we make sure that our supply chain are secured. Okay, they can go to US without any problem, for example. And then, of course, the most important is a social responsibility. All the stakeholders that we operate, we will make sure that all our surrounding society is being taken care. So this is our uh, uh, selling point of an HRC, the product that we are selling. Next. On the uh, Corey McCall side, uh, my other colleagues, uh, Andrew, uh, he's not with us today. Uh, so, but I will just briefly introduce. In CMC, there's a two key business. The first one is the CMC plantation, which is what I mentioned earlier, which we have uh, the plantation, the one of the big plantation in uh, Cameroon. And of course, another side of uh, the side is uh, CMCI, which is a distribution outlet. So what the key attributes on CMC here is we are trying to connect from the origins of the raw materials all the way to the customers and the end users. So this allows us to basically distribute all our own produce from our own plantations to the end customer that are willing to pay at a better price rather than go through the middleman. And of course, uh, in US and, and in Europe, uh, the distribution business also cater for all the supply chains uh, for our end customers. So you will see that at the moment, we have a lot of business have having suffering issues on supply chain logistic issues. And this is where our business have this advantage. We cover all the logistics uh, uh, arrangement for our customer that allow us to have, uh, 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 can manage and, and can build a customer relationship better with them. And this is our one of the selling point for our CMCI business as well. Okay, so next. So as a snapshot, our 2020 sales volume is about 1.2 million ton. I will say that full year this year, I will say we are roughly about 1.3 million ton. Uh, global market share is about, let's call it about 10%. For our market share of the tire grade natural rubber, we are about 11 to 12%, I would say. Right, so what does it mean? We are a sizable player 
uh, in providing mobility and also in the medical field as well. Next. So a little bit of history about Halcyon. I think that some of you may have followed us from the beginning. Uh, we started out with, with uh, two factories in Indonesia and we go for listing. That's where after that we acquire, go through an acquisitive mode. Uh, our then uh, CEO, Robert, at that time went through a process of consolidation and going buying uh, all these good premium grade uh, so-called factories. And our Indonesia factories, uh, we are all uh, used to be owned by the Lee Rubber Group. So it's all the premium grade uh, factories. And then 2017, we then merged with GMG and also Sinochem Rubber Assets where uh, Sinochem effectively take uh, majority control of Halcyon. And from there on, I think we have done a few other acquisitions and that is where we are now, right? We are in a good state now to propel into the uh, much bigger scale now. Okay, go uh, next, please. So in the rubber industry, there's a few developing trends and then I will just go through very quickly. And then, then I will then explain to you why, where is our strategic positioning. Okay, next. So next. So the first one is the, we have to see that the, at the moment, the rubber price has been recovering recently. And for the last few years, it also has been improving. So this is one of the areas to look out for. Uh, well, better rubber price, what will benefit is our plantations and also our margin from our factories. And the second one is the consumption. With the lack of planting, that means that supply will be uh, lower. That will allow us to uh, so-called, uh, I mean, they will allow us to capture all this opportunity, right? Because when the supply is lesser than the uh, demand, of course, the next things that will happen is the price will go up. That will benefit our plantation business. Next. Okay. So, of course, uh, the world vehicle numbers, you all know all the usage, the car usage is uh, increasing on a year-on-year -year basis. That will also uh, support the demand of the natural rubber. Next. And this is what I mentioned earlier, the drastic uh, decline in the new planting. And also the next thing here is about the ESG, the sustainability, digitization, and the non-tire demand. So these are the areas that we are already in the driving seat. So when uh, the, our customers requesting for sustainability or digitization, we are already there. So because we have digitization, we have Hevia Connect, and sustainability, uh, if you look at the next slide, uh, we have uh, uh, various awards and uh, uh, accolades to support our uh, efforts in our sustainability side. Okay, so uh, next one. Next. So these are the snapshot that what I've just mentioned. Okay, so uh, I think that that's capture what I've just summarized just now. Uh, next one. The following slides here, this is where I mentioned about the sustainability. So we have good awards rating in Ecovadi sports. We also have a commitment to do zero deforestation. We have an outgrower program, as what we mentioned, support the society. And then we also have one of the, uh, I mean, pioneer in the rubber industry that get a sustainability link loan from Deutsche Bank. And the left-hand side is all the approval that we get from all the big names tire makers. So we're dealing with all the, uh, the, the blue chip customers. Okay, so next. Okay, so we have the one of the largest commercially rubber plantation and also the digitized uh, digital platform that we mentioned. Okay, this Hevia Connect is one of the interesting ones. And I also suggest that there will be some more development in this area in the, the next coming months. So uh, I think that's about it. I will hand over to Jeremy, uh, our CFO uh, for the next session. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Inkit. Uh, uh, if, uh, if I can have my video enabled, then yeah, that'll be great. Yeah. Yeah, whilst I'm waiting for my video to be enabled, uh, just one minute. Uh, 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 I need a host to actually help. Yeah, okay, great. 
Um, all right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um. Uh, in terms of the financials, probably you can see in this chart on the left, uh, from from sales volume perspective, which is basically a main main driver of the uh, the business profitability. You can see it's actually going downwards uh, from 2018 to 2020. Uh, the main reason for that is because of uh, COVID and et cetera. Uh, I don't need to go into the detail of the story, but looking at 2021 versus 2020, nine months period, can see that it's quite a healthy uh, uh, growth and a, a good recovery of close to about 20%. You do a simple extrapolation of the nine months result, uh, the nine months volume, you can see that easily actually breach or it will actually exceed uh, the level that we have for two, uh, uh, before, uh, before COVID. In terms of EBITDA, you can see uh, it's also coming out uh, nicely on a V-shaped uh, uh, basis. Uh, 2021, nine months, we have actually recorded 27.8 million uh, profit uh, uh, EBITDA. And that is actually a level that we actually uh, recorded uh, pre-COVID. And as uh, David mentioned earlier, this year we're going to make a, a, a good profit uh, as what we actually announced um, uh, uh, in, in the announcement. And going to the next page, you can see in uh, uh, HRC uh, financials is on the same trend as well. Our uh, EBITDA perspective is grow, growing uh, slightly slower than uh, the group, but it's still actually moving in a good direction. Whereas uh, on, a, on a next page on CMC financial, this CMCI, basically distribution business, we are able to actually capitalize the, the advantage that we have uh, there in US and Europe. Uh, on the logistic uh, log chain, uh, 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 we, we actually uh, also capitalize on the market shares. We common about 60-70% of the market shares in that uh, region. And with the advantage of the storage and uh, uh, storage and tank that we have in, uh, uh, in, a, uh, in the Europe, we are able to actually get a very good margin. As you can see, the EBITDA actually jump almost uh, uh, two, two and a half folds. Whereas uh, volume remains roughly the same. So technically what it means is that uh, the profit per ton has actually gone up uh, tremendously. And the next, uh, on the next page is actually the financial for CMCP. So CMCP, you know, is a plantation, is long gestation. We are still actually in a stage where it is still incurring costs. Uh, it is uh, uh, KPEX, I mean. So the average plantation age is about roughly 7.2 years. So uh, the yield is not actually at the optimum, I would say at, at a very good uh, stage at the moment. Having said that, in the next four years, uh, yield will actually double from twenty thousand per ton to forty thousand per ton uh, a year. So if you look at if you look at a price today at thousand five thousand six, that easily translates to an additional of thirty million uh, revenue for uh, the plantation. Uh, so that will actually go all the way down to the PBT line, and of course, uh, and of course, uh, uh, for from from a housing perspective, uh, will definitely benefit a lot. Uh, uh, with uh, in the next uh, four or five years when the treatments are more mature and the latex is uh, uh, producing in a more optimum manner. So unit cost will go down and uh, conversely, the profit will actually go up. Right. So uh, that is basically covered the, uh, the, the financials for uh, for the group in the three, three segments that I mentioned, uh, the HRC business, the CMC distribution business, and the CMC plantation business. In the next slides, uh, I would like to actually share with you the progress that we made in our deleverage plan. So you look at our balance sheet, uh, yeah, I think a lot of you will realize that our leverage uh, ratio is actually very high and we are very uh, uh, conscious about it. And we, in, in, in uh, announcements, in the latest, uh, in the announcements that we made late last year, uh, in terms of our deleverage plan, we managed to actually sell uh, 50 hectares of uh, lands that we, uh, we converted to free, freehold uh, in Ivory Coast. So the total uh, uh, hect uh, the, the total area that we actually converted is for 200 uh, hectares, of which 55 uh, hectares has been uh, sold. Uh, we're going to expect to uh, net uh, to 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 uh, to record a net gain of uh, 11.6 million out of these 55 uh, hectare uh, sales transactions. But what is also uh, important to note is that we still have another 150 hectares that we have not sold, and currently is carried at a very low cost uh, base. And based on the valuation is carried, uh, is actually currently valued roughly around 49 million to 72 million. And this is not something that we actually recorded in, in a book. So I think there is still a, a very vast potential, I'll say, in terms of uh, uh, the PL. Uh, uh, and the plan for us is to continue to actually dispose the land. We have the target to actually sell another 100 hectares this year. 
where uh, we, where we like to actually keep our 50 hectares for further, further review or further strategy review. So that's sort of sum up uh, the, the financials balance sheet and also the, uh, the PNL. And to recap, I think uh, the last page in terms of uh, the, the value propositions that we have that uh, from, from, presence, from presence perspective in terms of where our business actually uh, located is actually across all locations where it is suitable to plant rubber. So we have the advantage that we can actually compare the price, compare, can, can see what is the output supply across all different locations. That is very key advantage to us, uh, I would say. Uh, the second one is that we have uh, a wide ranging of pool from time and just these are all very top grade customer, Goodyear, can Continental, uh, Michelin, etc. Uh, whereas our non uh, tire business has also an entrenched uh, position in the US and Europe, you can see in the results that I presented earlier. And the third one, I will say, well, we are quite uh, we are we are probably the leaders in the sustainability space in uh, in the rubber industry. Uh, fourth being, we are one of the largest commercially owned rubber plantation, uh, uh, like what uh, Inkel have actually gone through with you. We have a huge plantation in uh, Cameroon. And uh, the last one, I will say, we are uh, pining digitiz uh, uh, digitalizing the rubber trades uh, via Heavy Connects platform. So I guess that's basically some of uh, our presentation uh, for today. And probably, uh, I think we can go to the Q&A session. Uh, thank thank you. you, Mr. Ng and uh, Mr. Lowe for the insightful corporate presentation. May I now invite Mr. Benjamin Goh, Head of Research and Investor Education from SIAS. Uh, he will be the moderator for the Q&A session. Uh, Benjamin, over to you. All right, thanks, Eileen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, David, uh, Jeremy, as well as uh, Inkiet uh, on the presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, that has come up, uh, you know, through social media as well as uh, the ones that we have previously uh, submitted. So I'm just gonna go through it in turn. Uh. Um, so certainly your presentation has been uh, very um, illuminating on the different business parts, uh, business model of uh, Hesion. So uh, I think some of the questions will actually um, be uh, pertinent for some of the things that you've already discussed. Um, okay, let's start with the first one. Um, the demand continues to be good with consumption expected to outpace production levels, uh, yet the process of plantation and production takes time and cannot be easily skilled, uh, scaled up at will. So as such, uh, what is Halcyon's current plantation and production levels and what is the company's strategy to capitalize on the sustainable demand for uh, natural rubber? Jeremy, you want to take this? Sorry, I wasn't. Uh, my mic wasn't. Uh, my 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 microphone doesn't actually work, so I lost a bit of that questions. Can you repeat again? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a you know it's a pretty good situation that uh the sector wise the demand is outpacing production. Um, so the question is about Halcyon's uh, current plant plantation and production levels. Uh, what is the company's strategy to scale up and cap and capitalize on the sustainable demand for natural rubber? Yeah, so I think uh, uh like I mentioned earlier, uh, I think there are two questions to this. One is on the demand. You know, uh, uh, and the supply probably in our plantation. The other one is actually our sustainability effort in the plantation. So uh, from, from, a, from a supply perspective, supply as, uh, as we actually uh, mentioned earlier, it is actually a, a process that we go through seven years, right? You will not be able to actually turn the supply immediately within a year or less than a year, right? So what we have done continuously in the past, uh, past years, I will say more than 10 years is, on continuing to actually plant, uh, 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 continue to actually invest in the plantation. So we have been uh, making a good progress on uh, planting new trees, try to actually make sure the uh, output of the plantation is uh, giving us consistent uh, yield. And that is what we actually expect to come in the next few years. So in uh, uh, one of the slides that I actually mentioned earlier, our yield currently is actually about 20,000 metric ton. Whereas uh, in four years time in 2025, our yields will go double, right? So, and, and that will actually go further uh, at 2030, uh, 2030 and 55,000 uh, uh, ton per year. So that is the kind of a revenue projections that I can, uh, that I think we can actually, I can actually look at. Uh, of course, I do not have the crystal ball on the price, but if you look at the price today, taking an average of 1,005. Today, uh, I think we're actually at 1,008. So you look, look at 1,005 
20,000 hectare additional debt basically means 30 million right, revenue straight down to the pocket. And that is on an annual basis, right? So I think that is to, to answer the questions in terms of the supply that we can actually produce. Uh, demand, I think we also have uh, two slides talking about uh, the, uh, the demand for, uh, uh, for, 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 for the cars, for the tires, uh, which uh, uh, Inca have actually uh, gone through earlier. Uh, and the other part is on uh, sustainability, right? So sustainability, I would have to say, we have actually spent a lot of effort, not just effort. I think the more importantly for me, uh, to me, sustainability is very important, uh, not just on the money that you spend, but it's more on the culture and the policy. And that is something that I think uh, has been uh, instilled in, uh, in every one of us, I think, in Helsinki, especially in the plantation since, uh, since, uh, since I joined five, six years, at least more than that. Right. So I think that is something that uh, I see uh, are very valuable uh, in terms of uh, uh, the behavior, how do we actually make decision, et cetera, guided from uh, that, that kind of policy, that kind of uh, uh, culture. And I will say that uh, to me, it is an intrinsic value uh, that I believe in the future, it will slowly turn into uh, something that is more rewarding. And as such, I think if you follow uh, close uh, enough us, uh, on Hebe Connect, you will see that's the kind of platform that we are trying to actually promote and also the kind of platform that we want to actually uh, uh, get people to trade on sustainability, uh, a sustainable rubber in uh, the industry. Mm. All right, thank you very much for that, Jeremy. Uh, a very good response, uh, elaborate response that kind of hits all the high points there. Um, coming through our uh, um, Q&A function in Zoom here, we do have a couple of questions uh, around the profitability, the um, share price, as well as the dividend policy of the company. I guess uh, from a quick read of the um, questions coming in, uh, I think there is some uh, question, uh, concern or query over the decline of the company share price over the years uh, and uh, when we could hopefully see a positive contribution to uh, profit uh, and therefore a uh, dividend. Uh, yep. Yeah. So I think from a from from a profitability perspective, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have uh, managed to actually release an announcement earlier, uh, just probably an hour ago. Uh, we we are we are quite uh, upbeat in terms of uh, uh, year two thousand twenty two as well, right? As our plantation get into a uh, uh, get into uh, get into a more mature stage and uh, our business got more uh, stable. I believe uh, 2022 will be a good start for, for us. And uh, looking at the demand today, we don't see any of uh, very negative uh, impact uh, that's uh, affecting us. Indeed, I think uh, we, we, are, we, we look to, to be a net winner from COVID, out of COVID, I would say. Right. And uh, on the dividend policy, I will have to say that uh, we take note of the uh, feedback from the investor with regards to this topic. And uh, we are continuously reviewing our strategy and options to enhance our, share, our shareholder value. And uh, if there's any change, uh, any change to this, uh, rest assured we'll update the market uh, via our, our formal communication ch channel as, uh, as when uh, we can do that. Okay. Um, um, related to that question, there is a quite a pointed question about the CMC plantation. So the question is, will the CMC plantation be above the break-even point in uh, 2021, I guess full year 2021, uh, can we expect to see positive contribution from CMC plantation to the net profit after tax for 2022? Robert, let me take this question on uh, David Lee. Uh, so uh, I think it's a very good question. So uh, first of all, on top of uh, what Jeremy has mentioned just now, so the yield from our plantation has, uh, I mean, is coming out just in time. So uh, we benefit from uh, uh, our uh, replanting, uh, the new planting during the last uh, 10 years. And now our uh, uh, younger trees are, are, are getting matured uh, gradually. So every year we will, uh, uh, I mean, we will have a, a new typing area of around 2000 hectares, uh, I mean, uh, in the next few years. So, I mean, our yield from the plantation will um, 
enjoy a continuous increase. And uh, I think uh, you have already uh, get the forecasted uh, quantity from the pr presentation. So uh, alongside the increase in the own yield from the plantation our break even, we are definitely uh, uh, enjoy a decrease of the uh, pr of the uh, uh, because of the cost uh, the unit cost will be uh, decreased, right? So uh, and we uh, we are of the uh, will that the uh, in the future the natural price will will be in the uptrend, and I, I think maybe probably some of the investors have already uh, uh, noted the latest. Uh, 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 latest uh, uh, paper from uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, they have a forecast that the, some of the uh, commodities, uh, including crude oil or some uh, other commodities, they will enjoy a, a, a good period of the price, they will enjoy a price increase. Uh, they have the forecast that the crude oil price will increase from $85 to $95 or even $100 per barrel. And uh, we uh, we are of the opinion that most probably the uh, natural price will also enjoy a, a uptrend in the next few months, uh, uh, not in the next few months, but in the next few years, uh, because uh, uh, because the uh, uh, investment in the new planting and the replanting uh, in the natural plantation was not uh, sufficient during the last. Uh, I shall say during the last five, six years. Mm. So uh, from our side, uh, definitely our plantation will enjoy uh, the price increase and enjoy the continuous decrease of our uh, brook even. Mm. And uh, uh, going forward, uh, we will, uh, uh, because we have very clear and uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, strategy to uh, uh, to continue our uh, replanting every year, yeah, uh, to further uh, to further modify the tree profile of our plantation. But we will not uh, do the new planting because we have uh, we have announced our zero deforestation policy in 1998. Mm. But we, however, we will encourage the smaller holders uh, surrounding our plantation to to cooperate with us, uh, to uh, take part in our outgrower program, means that we will uh, uh, provide them with, uh, with uh, technology, with tools, with some rice or, or something um, substitute uh, to, uh, to, I mean, to uh, encourage them to, to plant uh, natural trees uh, in those, uh, in those uh, uh, bare lands. Uh, I mean, uh, so uh, so which we are we are not affect the uh, sustain, uh, sustainable uh, of the environment, yeah. Which is also in favor of the uh, which is which is also in, in line with the requirement of the NGOs. So I shall see back to the question. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, we do have the view that uh, the results of our CFC plantation will be quite promising uh, in the next. Uh, a uh, few years, yeah. Uh, so in 2022, I I have confidence that the the result of our CMC plantation will be much better than that of 2021. Well, certainly this business is pretty cyclical, and there's a lot of uh, I guess time lag when you plant the tree and eventually harvest the you, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I guess that's part and parcel of this particular business. Um, there is a question regarding CMC distribution. Uh, so CMC distribution was probably the most profitable division in 2021. Uh, how much of the output came from Halcyon's processing and plantation units? Hmm. I guess quite a specific question yeah. on the uh, financials. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I think if you look at the sales volume, I think it's the questions about sales volume distribution across the group. So from a HRC perspective, uh, we are about uh, that, that that contribute uh, about two third of the total uh, output. Whereas for CMCI, it is about one third. So take uh, one point two million as our sales revenue, uh, sales volume. So roughly about three hundred. Uh, for 400,000, uh, that's attributable to CMCI. 
whereas another uh, uh, two-third uh, relates to uh, 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 HRC. In terms of the plantation, it's a very small, uh, small uh, fraction of what we have in a, a CMCI. Uh, uh, in 2021, I would say, yeah, our total uh, yield, uh, as I mentioned uh, in my slides, is about 20,000 tonne. So you can imagine the 20,000 tonne over 1.2 million trades that we did. But uh, obviously, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the calculation in terms of the profit coming from plantation and from processing is a very different kind of a calculation. Right. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. So that adds a lot of color to the question that was asked. Um, so a more general, I guess, competitive uh, strategy question. Who are Halcyon's competitors and what is their proportion of the total production? I guess the question is, who are the competitors and what's the market share? Uh, probably let's me take this question. So... Uh, 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 normally, we, we see that uh, uh, there are top five uh, natural players in the world, uh, including Hashem, which might be the world number one. Yeah. And we have the largest market share. Yeah. And we have a fully integrated uh, natural value chain. I mean, including the upstream uh, plantation, uh, the medium stream processing, and downstream uh, distribution, as well as our uh, e commerce platform, I mean, digitalization, I mean, heavy connect platform. And then there are some other players. Uh, 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 there are three Tron, uh, the Southland of China, Guangkan uh, 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 City Farms, and the Hainan Rubber State Farms. So uh, these are the uh, top players in the world. And uh, 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 regarding the competition, I shall see the different company has different model. So we have different customers, and the customers. Uh, it's a mature market. It's a mature market. So uh, the uh, different company has different uh, blue list, uh, blue chips customers. Uh, for Hershen, we we have uh, a very long uh, and very good uh, uh, strategic strategic partnership with our customers. So uh, uh, out of the total uh, sales volume of uh, HRC. 70% goes to the uh, top 10 customers uh, in the world. And also in CMCI, our, uh, our customer are, the, uh, are also the top and leading customer uh, from the rubber pro uh, products uh, industry, as well as those uh, like uh, including those uh, uh, gloves industry or, or uh, 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 this 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 uh, matrix uh, latex uh, latex matrix or latex pillow or uh, that's balloon. So I shall see uh, it's a mature market. So there is competition, but there is also cooperation uh, among these uh, uh, top five competitors. Yeah, mm. and going forward, I shall see that uh, uh, those companies who have this uh, full uh, integra uh, fully integrated uh, natural value chain will uh, will. Uh, we all have more uh, um, uh, uh, competitive advantage in, in deliver sustainable development. Okay, I guess uh, the trend towards a vertical integration is also kind of exacerbated by the current supply chain issues. So it could be possibly uh, better to bring everything in-house. All right. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, so let me just quickly run through maybe one or two more questions. Uh, there is a uh, another question regarding the share price. So uh, this investor bought the Halcyon shares uh, about a year ago and lost uh, about a third of the sh um, share value. So I guess the question here is, uh, would you be able to add some color as to, you know, um, how, uh, you know, why was it such a challenging year for Halcyon and, and um, you know, um, the, the share price uh, moving down uh, a fair bit in the year 2021? Uh, maybe I take the question first and let Jeremy to, uh, to add on something after my, uh, uh, my uh, message. So I think, uh, you know, uh, the share price is uh, is driven by uh, many different factors. Okay, so the 
I shall see from my point of view, I shall see the uh, uh, the share price of those uh, uh, commodities company, including, uh, I mean, crude oil or some other commodities, uh, they, they suffered a little bit from the COVID-19. Uh, uh, they suffered from the, the fierce price fluctuation in 2020 and 2021. So if you uh, have a review of the price movement of crude oil or uh, copper or natural rubber or even iron ore, you, you, you may easily find out that the, the price fluctuation, fluctuation is quite, uh, uh, quite fierce, right? So, uh, uh, and for uh, back to the natural rubber industry, I, I shall say that uh, we we, uh, we 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 also couldn't uh, uh, stand alone uh, or stand aside from from this kind of commodity uh, fluctuation. Yeah, and uh, there are a lot of uh, headwinds because of the COVID nineteen. Yeah, uh, but. Uh, I shall say that uh, uh, for the investors, maybe it's, it's uh, maybe it's good for for Hessian to 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 uh, to keep uh, more uh, frequent uh, communication with our the investors of the banks to to in order to let them have better understanding of, of our business model because uh, we have the uh, plantation business model, we have the processing business model, which which uh, is quite different from each other. Uh, I shall see that uh, uh, in Hershen, uh, one of our uh, uh, pillar is to to reach uh, the uh, corporate excellence. Means mean that to 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 uh, create value added for our investors and for for our shareholders. So, so I, I think that uh, uh, I, I don't want to find excuse for our uh, share price movement in twenty twenty one. But I, I think. Now we are in a uh, more better position to to uh, have a more prof promising share price in 2022. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I, I tend to agree with David in terms of the communication and also the education. And as such, we are running quite a number of uh, roadshows uh, off private uh, with the security firms and as well as uh, SIS. Right, I think it's a good opportunity for us to actually get the investors more educated in terms of our business. Our business are something I would say it's the own industry, uh, but the model that we have is uh, a bit complicated in a way, right? We have a processing business uh, jumbled up with the plantation, which has a different cost, uh, cost, uh, cost base um, uh, way of our management as well. So, so I guess uh, by 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 showing the financials in such a way and also going through the education stage, education session with uh, the investors, I hope that will actually give the investor better understanding of how. Uh, we actually run our business and how we actually make uh we make our profit and uh, i guess yeah yeah from 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 now on, we we definitely will actually engage the investors more to make sure uh we are we are, we are properly valued uh, uh in the market yeah well i mean certainly the share price is not directly control uh controlled by uh the management of the company uh, i guess uh, to the extent possible you will try to uh, maximize profitability and that's how you create share uh, you know value for shareholders um so uh very appreciative for your very uh candid uh response to to the question that was submitted uh, you know um, just now through the q a function uh so very appreciative uh that also um you know um that you're going to be focusing a lot more on the communication so certainly this this business is, um, I guess it takes a certain kind of uh, investor, a little bit more long term, a little bit more um, comfortable with the cyclical nature. Uh, but obviously, that's how it works in the commodity world. All right. Um, I think we only have got uh, time for more, one more question. And let me just quickly, ah, this is a good one. So it seems that the rubber plantation needs a lot of uh, investment. Uh, will, will Halcyon be looking at raising additional funds soon uh, to basically fund the uh, future growth? But of course, you know, uh, you know, we 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 are not asking for insider information. So obviously, if it's not <laughs> it's meant for public consumption, you don't have to tell us. 
Sure. I think financing is always a, a question that uh, I always uh, look at uh, 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 in, in Helsinki, especially for the plantation. So as uh, we mentioned, plantation is a, is a long gestation uh, period kind of business. Right? If you have a seven years, uh, zero income, you keep on have to actually uh, pump in money to actually plant. So you don't have, uh, if you don't have the cap uh, capital uh, uh, base, you don't have the, uh, uh, the support or source of the funding necess uh, necessary to actually fund the plantation. Of course, then uh, you want to run two ways. One, you close down your plantation. Two, you let, just let your tree dies. Because after, even after, even after you actually have your uh, trees coming to maturity, uh, the first few years is where the maturity, uh, the, 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 the latex, the yield is actually at the low, uh, low end yet. Right, because it takes another four or five years before you get into the big, uh, big production period. So yeah, so we, we I constantly actually will, uh, look uh, look at our balance, look at the uh, financing need, especially the capex. And of course, uh, the best thing is if we uh, other business we can actually have that uh, uh, sort of substituted. But again, that is how the complication comes in terms of the business model that we have. Right, you have one business that is uh, very capital intensive. The other one is. Uh, a, a long-term capital intensive, where, whereas the other one, you, you need a lot of working capital to actually buy from farmers and, and process. So, so uh, the financing plan uh, for, for, for us in the, in, in the plantation, definitely, yeah, if, uh, in, this, uh, in this few years, you look at the profile that we have, we, uh, yeah, I'm not shy to say that yeah, it's something that we always I'm constantly looking at. Mm. Well, on so top of what Jeremy, sorry, uh, uh, on top of what Jeremy uh, mentioned that uh, you may have noted that we have just announced uh, our uh, successful disposal of uh, some piece of land uh, from TRCI, one of our subsidiary. Mm -hmm. Actually, starting from uh, the beginning of 2021, we have a strategy uh, to dispose those non-call assets and non-profit, non, uh, profit, uh, non uh, let, let's say, uh, effective uh, assets. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will uh, continue to monetize to monetize those. Uh, uh, non-core SS and to uh, to obtain uh, uh, proceeds uh, from this uh, disposal of the non-core assets and to support our further investment in our plantation. So we feel we we have confidence that in 2022 we will have more uh, we will achieve more uh, sales on the disposal of the non-core assets and uh, monetize a lot of money to support our plantation. And before that, uh, I shall say, uh, uh, I mean, uh, much appreciation for your uh, question and for, for the support, for the continuous support from our investors. Back to one question, I shall say that we management, we are working on the dividend policy of Hershen. We are going to, most probably, we are going to have a fixed uh, dividend policy in the future. Yeah, thank mm. you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for adding a lot more color into your, um, I guess, uh, cash flow management uh, pr procedures. Uh, and I guess uh, it is actually a, a point of comfort to uh, retail investors that uh, most of your funding needs, uh, you know, sounds like it's going to be uh, generated organically through the disposable, uh, through the disposal of, uh, I guess, um, not, uh, I guess, the, the, the non-producing kind of uh, property assets that you have. Okay. Yes. So, um, so again, uh, we have run out of time. It is ten past eight. Uh, I would like to thank CEO uh, David, uh, Jeremy, as well as Inket for joining us today. Um, as CS, we are always very appreciative for senior management, especially uh, like you, senior senior management, to, to join us and to add uh, color to the narrative. Uh, it is actually, um, you know, when we read research reports and all that. Well, it, it's kind of nice what uh, Jeff how we you know go through the presentation. Uh, but it's always great to be able to ask uh, questions directly to senior management. Very appreciative uh, with all the candid uh, narrative as well as the uh, answers that we have provided. Um, we Thank hope to see much, you Jeremy. again. We definitely hope to sure. see you again. Uh, so uh, if if there are you know opportunities for us to do things like this again, uh, we would very like uh, very much like you to um, you know be able to participate. Okay. Sure, um, it's our pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much to you. Thanks, um, I would like to hand the time over to my colleague, Eileen. I'm not sure whether she's got any kind of closing slides that she needs to uh, show. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, senior management and Ben, uh, for the insightful sharing. I think uh, we have a better understanding about the corporate uh, business. Uh, I think we are slightly overrun, but uh, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. And of course, uh, well, the Chinese New Year is round the corner. 
I think on behalf of Sias, uh, we just want to wish everyone a happy Chinese New Year. And also, don't forget to like our Sias uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you can also go to our YouTube channel to rewatch the videos uh, for today's event. Uh, without further ado, uh, thank you, management. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank you, Eileen. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.